Uh, yeah, so, uh, so my name's Paul Herkham. I'm the, the Drainage Wastewater Management Planning Manager um, at Seven Trends. Um, and I've been asked to, uh, to come along and give everyone a bit, bit of an update on, first off, what, what DWP is all about, um, and to try and give you a bit of a lens as to where we, where we are from a, from a Seven Trends perspective. So um, without any more ado, I'll give you a quick overview of, um, of Seven Trends for those who don't, uh, are not aware of um, where we are and what we do. So we're one of the, uh, the, the largest um, water, uh, regulated water companies uh, covering England and Wales, um, serving about 4.4 4 million households and businesses, primarily across the, um, the, the, uh, the sort of Midlands area. So we've got quite a big patch going from sort of this mid Wales um, over to, uh, to sort of Lincolnshire and, and also from uh, the, the, the Horn Brestry all the way up to um, Paul Hedan, sorry, I should say, to, uh, to, to the Bristol Channel. Um, so we provide um, fresh drinking water for the area um, coloured in blue on the, on the map, and the wastewater area um, is, the, is the red area. And the little green blobs um, started across the map, that's showing the, um, the extent of our, our sewer, sewer, sewer area. Um, so that's, the, that's the, uh, the area we need to pick up as part of um, our DWPs. Um, and the, the only thing to note is that since um, July 2018, um, we've sort of split our Welsh arm off into um, to a separate separate to a regulated business um, called Hafren uh, Dubbadoy, um, which, so, so from my perspective, they need to produce two uh, dealer and peas, um, but because they're both linked in with the with the river, uh, with the Severn, then um, th th there is a bit of a linkage. But I'll, I'll come to that in a little while. So that's a bit of an overview about um, Seven Trent for those who, who might not be familiar, familiar with um, with who we are. So going into the to the meat of what this is all about. Um, so so what is a dealer and pea? Uh, well, drain to wastewater management plans. Um, they're a new initiative. So this came on came out of the back of some uh, some work um, that kicked off as part of the 20, 21st century drainage um, initiative to to look at how we're going to um, get our sort of wastewater systems fit for the 21st century. Um, and it was commissioned by um, by Water UK. Um, and DEFRA, Welsh Government, Offwat and Environment Tension, all those sort of listed on the, on the slide there, were involved in, in developing the framework. And a lot of this came about really because I think there was a bit of concern that um, the water and capture and plan, and I'll come on to that in, into a second. Um, but again, it's, it's trying to get into a position where we've got some, some consistency to demonstrate to our regulators, um, stakeholders and customers what the long-term plan is um, to make sure we've got a robust and, and a long-term resilient um, strategy with more of an emphasis on, on working with stakeholders. So cycle one of uh, DWP is going to be looking at the planning period from 2025 to 2050, um, basically picking up from, from the end of um, the current um, AMP planning period we're in with the intention of picking up and mitigating the future challenges from, uh, from climate change, new development, um, customer behaviours and expectations whilst maintaining sort of environmental um, quality standards, but also picking up the uncertainty. Um, and uh, there's, there's two documents being published, and I'll come back to those in the slides at the time. So from a 7 perspective, um, we've always had the ethos that you can't manage what you don't know. So um, back in 1984, um, we started looking at um, developing, initially they're called drainage area um, studies, and they were then changed to drainage area plans. And initially they were sort of on a 10 year planning cycle. Um, but the risk with those obviously is you can end up with with your, um, your plan or your strategy potentially being um, a few years out of date. So in 2010, we moved to a, um, to, to a process of keeping all of our catchments live. So at that point in time, they were, they were live and ready and, as of 2020, all of our catchments have, have, have been at that status. Yeah, sorry. Well, we've lost the slides. Share them again. Have you? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what's going on there. Can you see them now? Yes, but they're, they're not the full page. Right, sorry, I was just checking they're okay. It's better. 
So, so, so I don't know what was happening there. But, um, yeah, so, so it seems to be the, to be that technology is trying to uh, stop us on, on this. Um, so yeah, so it's only position where we've got sort of live models and we use them for various purposes. So um, understanding what headroom we've got in the catchment, how we can accommodate new developments and also using them to um, to predict overland flood paths um, as necessary to understand um, sort of flood risk and also work with our um, with our partners to address multiple sources of flooding. And if anything, where, where I think some of the concern came about was that um, our stakeholders weren't aware of a lot of this was going on primarily as we were doing it, um, and, but then using it for internal purposes. And if anything, what we what um, it showed is we need to start um, sharing some of this information. And uh, I think a lot of this comes back to these these little sort of slides about in, in the past we've all been in our own in our own sandpit, building our own sandcastles and do various bits and pieces. Um, um, it's, we're at a stage where we realised if we can all build the same. Uh, be, uh, realize we're all in, in the same sandpit and then collectively we can build up a, a better sandcastle and a better future so that's ultimately where we're trying to get to is, is to share the information that that companies have got to build on and supplement other plans to to end up getting uh, sort of better outcomes for our customers so key stages of, of dda um what they what they're trying to do, and this this is set out in in, in the framework, is ultimately go through a, a phase process to initially understand what are the long term challenges that you're trying to sort out, the big issues we're trying to to, uh, to address, and what outcomes are we trying to achieve. Uh, the next stage of it is to um, identify what risk we've already got in the catchment to be able to sort of prioritise which catchments are more uh, more at risk at risk risk than others. Then go through and identify if we don't do anything within that catchment um, to understand what the future impacts will be from climate change, growth, and, and urban creep primarily, is to try and quantify what the the future um, deterioration would be. Once we once we've got that, we understand what the catchment needs are. We can then look at um, developing um, options to to address those risks, um, but not just from a wastewater perspective. Looking how the wastewater solutions can deliver uh, wider benefits. Um, and then ultimately feed that into um, in, into a, an optimal plan, which ultimately then can get fed into uh, the business planning program. Um, when it comes to staying in the DWP work, they're referred to as the strategic context, risk-based catchment screening, uh, baseline risk and vulnerability assessment, um, option development appraisal, and then program program appraisal. And then the intention is once you, once you've gone through that cycle, we've got a DWP output. We then feed that into our business planning process, uh, which for, for the next round of DLP will be our ramp eight uh, business plan or PR24 as it's also known. Um, that will hopefully then get um, get funded, we'll then implement it, and then five years' time we'll go around the circle again. So the intention is that this will get uh, refreshed every five years. Um, so when it comes to, to further reading, if you want to know more information, rather than me put links on there to um to, to where the documents are. The best way to Google put Water UK DDMP, and that's the first link that will come up. Um, and within there, you've got a, um, a, there's a thousand page technical uh, guide, which um, I don't recommend that you read because um, it, it, it's quite sort of clunky and uh, very technical. Um, but there is a, a 16 page non technical overview, which I think is probably a, a it's certainly a better read and will give you an overview of what DDMPs are and what they're trying to achieve. Um, so that's a quick overview of um, of DMPs. What I'm going to do now is you start to go through the process in a little bit more detail, with with more of a, a focus on on sort of seven trends area to try, if anything, to try and bring to life the type of things we're trying to pick up as part of um, the DMP journey. So from a structure perspective, what the, the way that the DMP framework is set up is that you've got ultimately the they're in three levels primarily what's termed as, as tactical planning units um, which for intensive purposes they're the, the wastewater treatment works catchment areas um, so this is a map of the uh, this, the seven trent and Avon um, wastewater region and the blue areas are where we've got um, the wastewater catchment so across the, the, the overall seven trent and Hafrin uh, patch there's about 14 percent of the, of the land area that's actually sewered 
then the um, so they'll be assessed at, at, a, at a treatment works level. They'll then get amalgamated to level to um, to, to the next level, which is at the strategic planning areas, which pretty much is based on river basin management districts. The, the primary purpose of that is obviously the linkage areas with the environment and going back to uh, sort of river um, river basin areas. And then the outputs of those then will get collated into um, the, the final DDMP reports. Um, and I said earlier from, from I've, got, I've been tasked with delivering um, a DDMP um, document and strategies for for both um seven trent which is our sort of english area and afrin dovidiri which has our, our sort of a well so that's the way that this the um the, the process is structured when it comes to who's involved um it's not just a wastewater plan so we've got two do two dwp areas um with with 14 strategic planning areas sitting below those but from a semi-term perspective, we've got three environment agency regions we need to consult with, um, covering 13 um, river basin management areas. Um, from a Welsh perspective, we've got natural resources Wales to, um, to consult with, as well as Welsh government. Uh, we've got Natural England. Uh, we've got the 28 local lead local flood authorities, which obviously are key when it comes to the, the drainage element of it. Um, 80 local planning authorities. Not all of them are wholly within the Trent area, but um, Need to uh, to consult with those to understand what their future plans are from a uh, from a new development perspective. Um, we've got 13 um, catchment-based approach partnership areas. So again, there's linkage in there, looking at wider um, sort of potential uh, opportunities. We've got two local river trusts, obviously the River Seven and the River Trent, and we've also got um, 10 wildlife trusts. So the, there's a lot of a lot of engagement to take place um, as part of this this work. Um, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a, in, a, in, a, in a few slides time. So when it comes to DMP timeframe, so this is um, the, the program we put together. Um, it was a few years back now, um, and that was that was going pretty much to plan um, until sort of COVID turned up. Um, but the key dates that we're looking to um, to hit are draft publication by the 30th of June uh, 2022. So just over sort of 15 months uh, away, um, with a view then to publish the, the, the final um, DLP document in March uh, 2023. So that can then use to the, um, the, the, the AMP 8 or PR24 business plan, which is expected to be in autumn 2023. So, so that's where we're working to, but I say we've got this sort of the, the, the sort of nemesis there is COVID that's, um, that's caused a few issues um, and it's been a bit of, bit of a challenge um, but if anything it's, it's been a, a positive learning experience from it. So at the, at the start of the, um, the sort of process I explained we've got strategic context and what this is trying to do is set out what leader MPs are trying to achieve. So because we need to sort of check in with our stakeholders we published a, a strategic context um, consultation in um, when was it now? Is October? No, 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 October 2019. So what this was trying to do, if anything, was to raise awareness with our stakeholders of what the EDMP is all about, because they're not statutory at the moment, and some organisations won't understand what they are. So again, explain what the EDMPs are, what the planning objectives are, and trying to explain to um, to stakeholders what the benefit is to to them to to sort of support us and work with us. Obviously, the key challenges we've got from from a, from a, a future perspective is picking up those sort of environmental challenges from climate change, new development, and um, making sure we comply with with future environmental standards. We've got customers um, that um, at the moment we've got we've got issues with um, uh, misuse of sewers. They're putting stuff down the sewers they shouldn't be doing, like sort of wet the wet wipes and fats all in grease. Is the usual stuff that you've often seen on the television. Um, there's different levels of, levels of expectations, changes in water consumption, um, and also the, the, the thorny problem of, uh, of paving over front gardens and increasing runoff, which is a, which is a constant issue. Um, but again, it's not it's not the kind of thing that customers will really understand. Is that even though it's, it might only be perceived as being a small action, collectively across the catchment it can cause an issue. Um, then also, let me make sure we've got resilient systems. Um, to make sure we can deal with our future um, uncertainty and trends we've got, primarily with with sort of climate change, which um, it is it is uncertain. We know we know that it's happening, 
Um, but we don't, what we don't know at the moment is what that could um, could turn out to be. And what we also did as part of that is set out what the strategic planning objectives were, um, which are primarily just the benchmark to say these are the sort of things we want legal keys to assess, and then we can we, we can then measure success and um, uh, the, uh, the, the the sort of quality of, of a different strategy by by referring back to those. Um, and the intention is that it's not just sewage company um, outputs; it, it considers um, sort of wider aspects. So the the planning objectives we're, we're looking at, and we've got the, the one as you expect is to um, to manage and reduce the risk of, of sewer flooding or, or controlled escape of um, of wastewater, both for internal and external areas. Clearly, because we've got uh, the, the drainage aspect of it, is to be able to do that in such a way that uh, or come up with strategies that not only address the sewer flooding issues, but also help work in partnership with with others to manage um, surface and groundwater flood risk. And whilst that is not something that um, Seven Trent would be would be funding. It's, it's one of those things that if we can come up with more sustainable strategies to manage surface water, then that obviously gives an opportunity to manage surface water with our um, with other flood risk management authorities. So we get wider benefits than just building a, a big concrete tank, which will only only address um, the sewer flooding issues. Um, clearly, from a, from a uh, local planning perspective, I want to make sure that future growth can, can be accommodated and do that in a, in a sustainable way. Clearly, maintaining treatment works compliance um, is going to be key to all of this to make sure we don't have an impact on the um, for on the sewage system is make sure that, um, that we don't have unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory intermittent discharges or storm overflow so they don't cause issues to the environment or any harm. Um, make sure we've got resilient assets so um, so that sort of manages the future risk. So if anything does happen to our assets, then, then, then we, we sort of understand that risk and we've got plans in place to mitigate them. And then to complete the water cycle <coughs> um, is to make sure we've got um, a linkage into the water resource management planning, which in effect is, is what is sort of the, uh, the sort of the, the brother or sister of, of deed on peas. Um, and again, I've got, I've got a slide in, there in a little while to sort of pick some of some of that aspect up. Um, and again, what that is prim primarily trying to do is say, well, if we can come up with drainage strategies that um, manage sustainably, um, but also give the opportunity to um, to try and recharge um, or, or, or sort of help with low flow river flows, again, that's a wider benefit. So it's, it's quite all encompassing. Um, but, and then the next stage of that is to try and understand well what what are the catchments we need to look at so we've got just over a thousand catchments across across our area um but clearly it's going to be quite a big task to look at every catchment and some catchments don't need to don't need to be looked at so so that's really what the risk-based catchment screening <coughs> um, stage is all about and it's primarily just asking 16 uh, sort of questions for a catchment to understand whether or not there's anything significant that might sort of trigger um, a more detailed assessment. Um, a lot of these link in with existing um, frameworks and information that's available. So the first one, for instance, um, there's, there's a, um, a new metric that I've what introduced um, a few years back to understand the risk of, of flooding uh, to property from the sewage system in, in a one in 50 year rainfall event. Um, so again, that's, that's part of um, the process to understand if you've got a catchment with a lot of risk, then clearly that's one you should look at. Um, from a same trend perspective, um, the second one um, is, is not an issue because we don't have any discharges to bathing or shellfish waters, um, but clearly we do have um, discharges to, uh, to inland waters, which is where um, uh, indicator three comes into play. And this is really trying to feed in where um, natural England and natural resources Wales um, on their on their sort of um, risk database, I've got potential um, locations where wastewater issue, issues could be um, could could be having a detrimental impact. So again, they they should be clearly part of um, of D D P, um, which they are. Um, storm overflow assessment framework. Um, clearly that that's part of it. So if you've got any overflows that um, that aren't going to be addressed in 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 this current out period, clearly you need to make sure you've got a plan in place for the next. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece of work done a few years back um, to look at a capacity assessment framework. 
uh, to try and identify areas where um, the, the sewers are surcharging. So again, if you've got a system where there's a lot of surcharge in the catchment, that's an early indicator that um, that catchment might be um, under, under stress. So again, looking at that, you've got the usual ones then with um, six, seven, eight, and, and nine and 10 really, looking at current performance. Um, so has the catchment got high levels, high levels they expect from a, from a sewer flooding perspective? Um, are there, are there a lot of pollutions in the catchment? Are the catchment struggling from water, um, team works compliance uh, perspective? They're all the type of things that, again, will trigger to say, there's, there's something in this catchment you need to look at in a bit more detail. Um, and the last uh, a couple on here, um, looking at some overflow spills, again, if there's any indication that um, overflows might be operating outside the, outside the permit, um, and there aren't plans in place already to, to address those, which, which there are in, in the majority of cases. Um, when there's any link to the other, sorry, is it gone again? Yes, you've lost the screen again. Yeah, I, I do not know what's happening with this at the moment. Let me share it again. Is everybody? We'll get there eventually. Right, okay. Lovely. So, so off we go again. So I'll keep an eye on that bottom bar. See if that disappears. Um, so, um, where was I? So, um, yeah, links with other risk management authorities. So, again, we've got some catchments where there's, there's a direct interaction with local water courses, particularly on the River Seven, where high river levels interact um, and sort of prevent the uh, the wastewater system uh, from discharge. And there's an element in there to look at new developments. So, again, reviewing what the the local planners are telling us. To identify whether or not development in that area is 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 expected to have a, a significant issue or not, um, looking at um, what's in the in the water industry national environmental program, um, so a lot of that picks up work that needs to be done in AMP seven, but there are some where it's a case of in AMP seven that there's the investigation work on the basis then for AMP eight and beyond. That's when we'd, we'd invest. So clearly, if it's not if, a, if an issue is being investigated in this AMP period. And clearly, as part of our paint, we then need to include it within the uh, within the scope of DRMP. And the last two, um, they're known as being the, the sort of second tier indicators. So on their own, they wouldn't trigger, um, but they do get assessed, and they're primarily from a uh, from an asset health perspective. Uh, those have been sewer collapses and sewer blockages, which um, are more within the realms of the water company to address, rather than working together with others to address it. But again, it's one of those. Um, elements where if there's an issue, it gets flagged. It gets flagged up. So again, within the DMP process, we can then do sort of the uh, due diligence to understand what the issue is and how we're going to sort it out going forward. So, so the assessment of all the catchments, so all thousand or so catchments get assessed, and you end up then with um, with a sort of table um, similar to this, broken down for all the catchments, um, indicating whether or not they, they uh, sort of trigger the next stage. And the, the, the assessment we've done, we've got 57% 57, 57 of our catchments that are triggering, um, but in total they're covering 99.1% of the connected population. So it's, it's primarily the smaller catchments, as you'd expect, uh, aren't, aren't sort of triggering. Um, that doesn't mean they get, get forgotten about um, because they get refreshed on, a, on an annual basis, just to make nothing chat, um, that might sort of warrant uh, uh, a, a, a look in, in a little bit more detail. So, so, so on the on the outcome of that of this stage primarily is to identify and, and filter out which catchments you need to have a look at in a bit more detail. Which ones, in this case of, there doesn't seem to be a big enough problem, but just keep an eye on it. So, the next key stage is Bravo, and this is where things start to get interesting. And, and, and Bravo is baseline risk and vulnerability assessment. And ultimately, what you're trying to do is is understand what the current baseline risk is for the catchment, and then undertake a vulnerability assessment to, to, to quantify if you don't do anything by 2050, how bad will the, will the, will the problem get? Um, and then from that, you can understand which catchments um, you need to, again, look at in a bit more detail. So when it comes to Bravo, clearly future pressures we're looking at is from, from a customer perspective, we've got challenges from customers' behaviour. So about um, customer misuse. So every year we spend uh, around 10 million pounds to deal with blockages, of which 70% of those um, are related to 
uh, to customers putting things down the, down the sewage system that they shouldn't be putting down. So again, it comes back to the um, to the initiative you might have seen about only put the three P's down, P, paper and poo. Um, anything else, it should be a case of pop it in the bin. Um, and we've also got, um, as I mentioned earlier, the paving over um, front gardens and building conservatories, which which increased runoff, which which wasn't um, allowed for in the initial uh, design of the sewage system. And then the double whammy you get then is people paving over the front gardens. You then get sort of 20, 30 percent climate change on top of that, um, which then uh, in increases runoff e even more. Um, we've got uh, customers' expectations um, being tightened, so um, acceptability of, of sewer flooding is, 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 a, is a constant challenge, and quite rightly so. And, um, and we've also got the challenge um, to, uh, to, to make sure that the, the, the bills that customers pay are, are as low as they can be, um, and also they're getting value for money, um, which is, which is uh, one of the key aspects that, that obviously off-water always... Um, we sort of challenging water companies to be more efficient and, de and deliver um, deliver sort of customer um, expectations. Um, we've also got changes in water consumptions. So so this can affect that can, this can be a positive for, from the from the water side, but it could also can be a negative from the sewage side because clearly we need um, our wastewater systems to uh, to maintain self cleansing. And as many many of you will be aware, is that when uh, sort of our, our Victorian forefathers built a lot of our uh, our drainage systems they built them with combined systems in, in mind um, on the basis that um, under normal conditions they wouldn't have self cleaning but then when you get heavy rainfall that will then sort of flush the, the, the flow through um, so we just need to be wary going forward that taking flow out cannot always be a, a, a positive but it's one of those things that um, we need to be aware of it and when where needed we might need to uh, to put to put something in place to uh, to address the self uh, cleansing issues. Um, environment uh, environmental aspects, um, new developments. Obviously, that's always a, a big challenge. Um, so we've got a large number of properties being planned to be built across the Seven Trent uh, region in the in the next five years. That's going to continue into the uh, into the DWP planning period. Um, one of the issues that we that we've got is the right to connect surface water to the public sewage system. So for those that don't know, um, if there's only a foul sewer available, um, for a public foul sewer, even though there might be alternatives of connecting to a riparian owned water course or to a terrain, developers haven't got that automatic right to connect. So often we see developers come along and say, right, I can't get into the water course because the, the, the landowner won't let me. Therefore, I'm going to exercise my right to connect surface water into your foul sewer. Um, and, and, and we have to then deal with that. Which is clearly not um, something we'll want to do, but it, but uh, to happen. But clearly, if we can work with local authorities to understand where this could happen, we can then look to work with developers to uh, to make sure there's a, there's a positive outfall available. Uh, climate change that, that's that's the biggie. Um, so we all know that um, we're seeing more shorter duration, high intensity summer storms, and we're getting longer wetter winters, um, which obviously have an interaction with um, with, with the wastewater system. Um, which is primarily way, where you get deed on peace coming to play because you're trying to manage that linkage between the two to make sure that uh, inflow into the system from 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 other surface water discharges can be, um, can be managed and also we can get outfalls into the um, into, into the into the river network um, and the final one is environmental standards so clearly from a from um, from a climate change perspective that's going to put pressure on the system on the, the environment going forward with with lower flow rivers. So there's going to be um, more sort of uh, constraints from an environmental perspective, which clearly we need to uh, need to sort of factor in. Um, I mentioned this earlier about resilient systems. So we've got a lot of uncertainty going forward with climate change and what have you. And if anything, the only thing we're certain about um, about the future is the fact that it is uncertain. So we need to look at adaptive pathway solutions and also take into account that from a DDMP perspective, building ever bigger and bigger sewers is not always the thing to do and clearly there's more uh, there's more uh, flexibility if you can take flow out um, and, and, and manage that flow that way um clearly we're getting more extreme events so we, um, there's a picture there on the on the um the left hand side of, of, of severe weather flooding um, which is not all sewer flooding there's an element of surface water flooding but from a customer's perspective 
they don't care what the cause is they just want to want it resolving um, we can mitigate the risk so there's a, there's a floodgate there so we can sort of hold back the flow but again that's more of an interim solution potentially look at um at uh, resilient properties um and then the one on the on the um on, on the uh, the right hand side even though it's a picture it's a case of droughts can also have issues on, on the wastewater system by reducing the sort of base flows and potentially increase uh, um, blockage risk and, and therefore flooding risk. So again, it's something we need to, uh, to, to consider. So when it comes to um, what EWPs are about, in the, same, in the same way you've got water resource management planning that's looking at is there environmental capacity to extract the water, is there treatment capacity to treat it, and ultimately um, manage the the demand from a customer perspective. What DMPs are trying to do is sort of follow that on and say, okay, we, we, the, the WRMP finishes with, finishes with the customer, DMP starts with the customer, and then it's a case of how do we take the flow from the customer through the process through the sewage system, make sure we don't have um, undue uh, flooding or, or storm overflow spills through through the treatment works, make sure they're they're operating okay. Um, Make sure that there's environmental capacity and also take into account that the environment is also under stress and then ultimately feed this all back then because there is that linkage between um, what's coming out from a, from a drainage perspective that ultimately then goes back into the into the water cycle so that, that's a, a high level view of, of what this what we were sort of looking at from a dealer and p perspective and each one of those aspects is potentially an area where we could have um, future demand and what, um, what as, and as part of Bravo, what they do is, as well as looking at what the future impacts are on, a, on, on the system, trying to understand um, what the character, characteristics are within a catchment, to ask primarily two questions is first off, how big is the problem you're trying to sort out? So, so what is the problem? Where is it? And why is it occurring? And then also factoring in, well, how, how difficult is it to resolve? Because if, if you've got a catchment, which is, uh, is going to have a big impact in the future. Um, and it's also going to be difficult to resolve. That's where you need to potentially put more of your effort. And the way that the uh, problem, sorry, the, the Brava the, um, and the, the problem characterization setup is to do this assessment to understand which are your catchments where you could probably address it using VAU processes. So a lot of these would be the smaller catchments that trigger but they're not that complex. They're going to be fairly easy to, to sort out. So therefore, you might not need to look at them in a, in a great amount of detail, but you're going to get some judgments which they're a big problem. They're going to be difficult to sort out. Um, and therefore, you might look, have to look at um, solutions in, in, in a slightly different way than we've looked at. So, um, so, so, so that's um, it can be quite a, a mechanistic sort of approach to try and do that. But ultimately, ultimately, what we're trying to do is understand basically what, what makes a catchment tick so we can then come up with a solution. Um, looking at how big the problem is. So again, we're, we're looking at um, the baseline risk. So in this particular case, we've got the, um, the purple bar. That, under, that gives an indication of how much um, escape of flow we're getting at the moment. And then we can understand how now that will deteriorate by 2050 if we don't do anything. So again, we've, we've factored all that in. We run it all by catchments so we can understand which catchments have got any issues and which haven't. And then we can feed them back to the, uh, the planning objectives, which I mentioned earlier earlier on in the, in the, in the slide deck. Um, a series of questions that will inform how difficult the problem is to resolve. So understand, is there a lot of surface water getting in, this, in the catchment? Is it going to be easy to sort out? Uh, is there infiltration into the catchment? Which will be having an impact on, on treatment works capacity? So again, asking... A series of questions will then inform whether or not that problem is likely to be difficult to resolve or not. Um, does it mean bigger catchments are going to fall into the um, into the complex um, or enhanced uh, sort of stages? It could be the smaller catchments because of the, those particular characteristics. But again, that's what needle peas are trying to do is to understand which which catchments um, are potentially more problematic than others. When it comes to planning horizons. Um, We've got um, looking at the end of the planning period to 2050, um, but we also look at, need to look at intervening uh, planning periods um, for uh, sort of five, 10 and 25 year periods. So again, looking forward to 2050, if we've got a catchment where there's not a big, there's probably a benefit to then step back and look at the intermediate um, time steps 
Um, so again, it's trying to make a, take a pragmatic and proportional approach to understand what your catchment risks are. Um, but basically trying to understand if you've got a catchment you need to panic about, this is trying to, then for, trying to then inform how soon do you need to panic and how quickly you need to, uh, to address those issues. Um, a quick scoot through, um, through um, engagement. Um, this is one thing that came about really from the back of the fact that we've got all these people, all these um, stakeholders we need to consult with. And clearly what we need to do is get that rich picture of what a catchment's needs are. So, so we can run all the, all the data to understand from a wastewater perspective, what are the needs? But what we don't, what we need to check in with our stakeholders is, is there anything else we're not aware of that might be pertinent to developing um, catchment strategies? So the initial aim was we'd, um, we'd, we'd tire a ring, get along, put a, a not plans on the, uh, on the wall of, of our catchments and let everyone put post-it notes on there. But clearly um, this bad boy came along and, uh, and uh, ruined all of that. Virtual platforms. Um, and this is really a positive of what's happened on the back of COVID, if there can be any sort of positives. Oh. So, but, um, yeah, has he gone again? Yeah. Yeah, bear with me a second while I uh, read it. I don't know what it's doing. Um, if you click off at the bottom, you've got um, a little tag with um, people sharing the screen. Yeah, I'm not sure why it, why it disappears. So um, let me uh, crack on again. So, yeah, so. Um, so we use, use an online a portal, a portal to, to do this, which, which again, the format of it is quite useful because it's a um, of sort of text data and, and JS platforms. So we can sort of put branding videos in there, give a bit of information structure, explain to stakeholders what we're trying to do, give them information relating to maps, and ultimately then ask them to, to look at data, um, see if there's anything we're missing. It also gives the opportunity to feed back data um, to us. Um, and what we've done, we've sort of structured it in a way that where we're looking at three three main areas is, is there any, any areas of flood risk we're not, we might not be aware of? So this is primarily focused, has it gone again now, hasn't it? Has it disappeared? Yeah, it's gone. I'm going to grab it. What I'm doing is pressing the, uh, the down arrow to change the slide, so... Uh... At, the, at the bottom on the screen you've also got a tab and I'm wondering whether, whether you're hitting that when you, when you hit it. Go on to the next Yeah, I don't, the mouse is out of the way. So let me, let me just sort of crack on because I'm quite conscious that we're running a bit late. So I just want to get these last couple of slides out of the way. So there's a, there's a little bit of time for questions. Um, so we've got this platform, uh, quickly skip through it. Primarily look focusing on flood risk. Um, the environment and growth and development. So a lot of this flood risk primarily focused on uh, local authorities and the environment agency, make sure we haven't missed anything that might be pertinent. The environment is more from the um, from the environmental um, sort of stakeholder group to understand if, if there's anything there they believe we might be having an impact we not we might not be aware of. And the growth and development is prim is primarily a check in with the local councils to make sure we missed a, a five thousand house development um, that, that that they might be planning that so they haven't told us about yet. So um, as part of that, we, we've got to develop uh, a, a platform which is um, primarily GIS based but with, with information on it. So they can, the stakeholders can go in there, look at what we, we, we currently know. So, so they, these are sort of the, the plans we've got. So then go in there, review the data we've got on a catchment level. And if there's anything that we're, we're not aware of, then they can then feed back automatically within the portal. So again, this, this has been quite useful um, it's been a positive out on the back of um, not being able to uh, to meet up in person, and it's, it's certainly something we're we're looking to use as part of the final um, publication because it, it offers a lot of flexibility to uh, to customers to primarily to go in when they when they choose to and not having to to travel to a meeting room, um, which could take sort of a couple of hours to get there. So uh, so that's if anything is a positive um, feedback platform. Um, I'll skip through this one because that just is. Bit of technical stuff um, to, to allow us to feed feed the data back. But again, it's all automated. It allows customers and stakeholders to feed back um, data a lot easier than 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 it would be if it was um, using an, an alternative approach. Um, option appraisal. We are at the moment in the process, so we've completed all of our 
um, based on risk and vulnerability assessments. We understand um, where, what the catchment risk is at the moment, how that will deteriorate by 2050 if we don't do anything, but clearly we need to do something, which is where the option comes into play. Um, within the framework, there's a list of uh, generic options. So it sets out 15 in the, in the framework. Um, that's quickly grown to, to, uh, to over 40. But what we need to do obviously is, is to sort of trim that down. Um, but in simple terms, you might have over 40 options, but really there's only three things you can do from a series uh, and a wastewater perspective. Um, you can either reduce the flow getting into the system, so that's managing surface water more sustainably, um, managing um, overland flow that might be impacting the system, sorting out um, education, uh, customer education, so um, they're aware of um, the, the, the impact of putting uh, fat, soil and greases into the system infiltration which um, which can be an issue not so much for seven term i know other companies have, have real issues with that um we can then optimize what we've currently got um, so we can we can put smart systems in there to manage flow um dur during um heavy rainfall events um and then the if anything we with industry revert to the to the solution then they're like building more capacity um but clearly building more more sewers is, is, is not um or more sewer capacity and bigger treatment works is, is the less um, optimal option. Um, the ideal option is let's reduce flows um, because it gives us options then to, to work with others uh, to manage surface water. And as, as you see on that little wheel, there's, there's a lot of other plans in there about managing surface water. So again, feeding into that, um, that sort of aspect is, is essential. Um, the challenge we've got, of course, is there's a lot of catchments to look at. So for 7 percent we've got 522 catchments, of which 39 of them pick up 75% of the um, of the connected population. If we're looking at four um, strategic scenarios per catchment, three strategies per, per scenario, three planning horizons per catchment, we're looking at 36 assessments per, per catchment. Um, and if you've got 522 to do with 7 trend, that's just that's nearly 2,000 uh, solutions we need to assess. So oh. again, we need to focus on... Yeah, has he gone again? Sorry. Again. Yeah, I've, I've only got one more slide to go, so um, so bear with me, and we'll nearly be there. Right. So, let's get back to where I was. So um, yeah, so, so the, the, there's a lot to get done. So so this is um, going back to the program. We need to get this finished by the end of this year. So early in, early next year, we can then start pulling together. Um, what the optimal mix of, uh, of solutions are ultimate to make sure that what we put in our, in our plan is ultimately af affordable um, and uh, and also deliverable in the, in the in the in the future so that's just a high level view of uh, what we're looking at um, and this finally the next steps of what we're doing uh, for this year so i said the focus for this year is to complete the option development and appraisal so that's that is a big task um, so we've got all of our consultants that are raring to go to uh, to start working on that. We're just finalising the, the finer details of that. Um, we need to check in with our stakeholders to make sure that um, they're happy with, with what we're looking at. So we've got the information we, we got back from last year from the um, from the, the rich picture um, sort of check-in. So again, we need to to badge all that up and collect it together in some in a format that is going to be easy to understand. So. Um, so, so we we don't uh, take so they're they're sort of valuable resource because we know they're they're very busy doing doing other things at the moment. Um, we need to start looking at the the final um, format. So the um, the platform that um, I'll give you a quick overview. That looks like it's going to be um, something we can use um, for the final uh, report. Um, Timescales. The, the next big deadline is is publish the draft D P in. Uh, in June 2022, we've then got three months of, of, of consultation um, and then six months to update the plan to take account of anything that comes on the back of the consultation um, with the final business plan, with the final deal P being published in March, March, not March uh, 2023, and then that will be used to inform uh, the, the business plan. Um, at the moment, um, cycle one of deal P's is not statutory, um, but it is a, a regulatory output and, and um, it won't be tied any any water company that doesn't produce um, a good quality uh, drainage and wastewater management plan because that's going to impact on their the quality of their PR24 uh, plan. Um, but as part of the environment bill, the intention is that cycle two of the 
Um, and the reason why the first stage is a strategy is primarily to give time for companies to understand what works well of the framework and what doesn't work well so we can we can evolve it in the same way that um, that water resource management plan is, has evolved over the last sort of 20 years. Um, and I say their DLP will evolve. There is already um, work ongoing to look at um, cycle one, um, which we can then be used to inform um, sort of cycle two of DLP and clearly cycle two of DLP will then evolve even further to look at um, that's uh, so what we need to do as part of cycle three, cycle four, and, and whatever. So, so that was a quick overview of, of everything indeed on P related. So, so thank thank you for listening, and apologies for the uh, for the technical problems. I'm not sure what's happening there. So, uh, bound back to um to Katie, and then um, they can pick up any questions if you've got uh, any time left. Yeah, thank you for that, Paul. That was really interesting. Uh, we have got a few questions, and if anyone wants to ask any more, uh, please use the Q and A facility. First question is, you highlighted the importance of uncertainty. Could you say a bit more about how you're taking uncertainty into forecast growth, climate change and creep into account? Yeah, sure. So um, so, so as, as part of the Bravo work we've done, we're taking sort of central estimates to get an understanding of which catchments are, are more susceptible, um, primarily because, again, it's going to be a big challenge to start looking at all different scenarios but clearly if we've got a catchment that's very susceptible to climate change we can then run um, scenario testing on there to understand okay if that catchment um, it wasn't going to get 20 percent climate change it could get 50 percent how would that affect the, um, the the solution we're trying to look at and again looking at, um, at, at sort of growth trying to understand with with local uh, councils as to where development could happen and trying to, trying to be proactive to uh, to inform those discussions earlier on so there's, there's more work, work to do on on identifying them um, uh, sort of sensitivity um, but again that will be on a catchment by catchment basis again depending on the type of solution we're looking at um, another question then are there ways in which design engineers can help seven trent in addressing the steps under the option appraisal um, DDMP is not really at a, at a detailed design level. It's more a case of trying to get that high level understanding of is the best catchment strategy to, uh, to to build a big uh, a big tunnel that's going to cost X million pounds, um, or is it a case of you're probably best looking at um, a, a strategy based on on removing surface water. So it's not going to be down at the, the, the level of detail to say by 2035 you need to upsize this this section of pipe from from 225 or 675 diameter or 575 diameter it's not it's not at that level of detail it's just trying to get that high level understanding of this is the sort of direction of travel we need to go and this is the level of funding that we're going to need um, another question how successful has your engagement been through the virtual platform was that sorry how successful has your engagement been through the virtual platform um, it, it's been pretty good, to be fair. Um, I think a lot of it is, is on the basis that people or stakeholders, they, they can go into the portal when it suits them. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the original approach was we just hire a, a hotel room, ask everyone to come along, um, I say a hotel room, I mean conference room, <laughs> um, to, um, uh, to, to look at it. If, if, if stakeholders can't get there, then, then it, it's an issue. Um, so having a, an online portal to allow stakeholders to go in when when they've got the time available has been really good. And, and of the stakeholders we, we went out to, we've, we've got that 60 odd percent um, that, that sort of engaged and, and went into the system and checked the information. So the early signs are that, that it's working well. And that's why going forward, we want to sort of maintain that uh, that sort of um, virtual sort of space to uh, to engage with stakeholders. And the question then, uh, based on what you've learned so far, what are the ways you see the DWMP evolving? Um, what, it, what it will do is give us that sort of foresight to be able to go to, um, to external stakeholders, to be able to demonstrate to them that if we solve a problem um, by building bigger and bigger sewers, but in fact, by managing surface water, it's going to 
unless you don't put an evidence base to um, to all the risk mates, all the risk management authorities say managing surface water will address the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the sewer capacity issues. Therefore, we're looking to manage surface water. Therefore, if we can work with others, um, we, we can manage sort of more more um, more more of a problem than, than we would if we were just look, looking at it on our own. And also to be able to provide um, local planning authorities with the information to to say this is an area where it's highly water stressed. Here's the evidence for you to work with local developers to say, look, you need to manage your surface water sustainably, other, otherwise we're going to get uh, issues in the future. So a lot of it is really providing that evidence base and understanding to stakeholders so they can make their decisions as well as we can make our decisions. Next question then, assuming a lot of the models and information used for the assessments will have varying level of confidence, how difficult was it to take this into consideration? Um, it, it, it's always an issue when it comes down to uh, to models, but it, but again, what it will do is, is inform um, future sort of model builds so we can understand if we've got a catchment, um, which is, um, and we, we might look and say the best way to address that will be to um, to take out surface water. Then again, it gives it gives us an, uh, that sort of intelligence to say this is an area where we need to improve model confidence, or we've got development in an area where it looks like it's going to be um, difficult to resolve. Again, it gives us that that sort of early heads up that going into that catchment to improve model confidence um, will will help um, sort of speed speed up how we can we can accommodate. Um, New development in the future, which also means the developers then won't get any uh, any undue delays. Um, how have you managed the network uh, treatment works interface in the development of options to mitigate Brava identified risks? Yeah, so 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 one of the um, the, the inputs into to Brava is to understand um, what the treatment works capacity is at the moment and what theoretically could be the maximum um, capacity we could go up to. Um, clearly, sewage treatment works need to discharge into the environment, um, and as part of that, we need to make sure that um, the, the effluent quality is at a standard so it doesn't cause a, an adverse impact. Um, the challenge that we've got is um, that we might be able to discharge more flow, but that means we need to then tighten the, uh, the, the effluent quality, and that there's obviously a limit as to what, what is technically achievable at the moment. So that's one of the things we're sort of factoring in uh, into the process and also looking at um, what current processes we've, we've got on the site and, uh, and and what sort of land land is available should we need to then provide additional capacity so that that's been fed into the process um, to understand um, and inform really what what sort of strategic options we've got on the table okay. Okay, and then another question. What are the different uses of treated water or will oh, sorry, or will it be discharged to the seal rivers? Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure what that question is in relation to. Okay. Um, I had a question. Uh, at what point will SMPs get transitioned out as DWMPs develop? And then has Seven Trent and other water companies, are you having to develop new tools and processes to, to look at the DWMPs or have you already got kind of a lot of procedures in place which will help you transition from SMPs to WMPs? Um, well, the, the, ben the benefit that the Seven Trent have had is because we started back in 1984 and we brought our, brought our um, catchment thinking so it was always kept live and ready. Um, and, and we've also invested in, in our, in our um, sewer modelling stock. We, we're in a good position that we can understand, again, coming back to the adage that you, you, don't, you, you, you can't manage what you don't understand. We, we've been in a good place where we can do that, whereas a lot of other companies, they, they only build a, a model when they've got a problem, which then they might look and go, well, I haven't, I haven't currently got a problem, but as they haven't got a model, they can't understand, well, will you have a problem by, by 2050? And it's like, well, we don't know. Um, so, so, so they are having to sort of catch up. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions then. Uh, so what okay. are the main challenges you face in addressing the treatment discharge problems across your region in terms of resources, costs, products, regulation, legislation? 
Um, it, it's primarily trying to maintain compliance um, because of, because of the additional flow. So we get additional flow. We need to discharge. We need to get it to a to a tighter standard, um, and ultimately. It, the, the standard we can get to is, is, is limited by what's technically feasible, um, but also we're governed by what's what what the uh, the receiving water body can take. So in in some locations, <clears throat> we could be in a position where, where we get flow in a, uh, development in the catchments, um, and the environment just just cannot take it. So an option we 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 would have to then look at is well, where is the a catchment where we could take it and potentially then on to pump flows. To a different part of the catchment, or, or there'll be some cases where we might need to do some some like pre-treatment on the environment to um to to to, be, to to allow the environment to be able to take that flow. Okay, we've got another question coming through. Um, a key obstacle to partnership projects with other RMAs is misaligned funding cycles. How will DWMPs help overcome some of these issues? Um, I think this, this is going to be a challenge. Um, if anything, DLPs are, are, are like a, a missing piece of the jigsaw, but um, as, as everyone will, will probably be aware, DLPs and, um, and uh, water company investment are on a five-year cycle, and um, the environment agency often work on a, on a six-year rolling cycle. So there is misalignment, as there, as there are with other um, sort of like surface water management plans and the, and the like river, river basin management plans. So, so that is is an issue, um, but uh, at the end of the day, we, we sort of regulate on on a five year cycle, and that that's just how things work at the moment. Um, but certainly, I can see in the future being um, being a better alignment between what DDPs um, and, and on other plans are producing. But it, yeah, it, it is it is a, it is a an issue that's been flagged, but um, I'm not sure what the solution is at the moment. Um, well, that's it for all the questions. So thank you very much for that, Paul. It's been really interesting. Um, hope everyone no enjoyed problem. it. Thank you for, for doing this.